Welcome back, everyone, to the Stogie Geek Show. We've got a very special interview. We've got Mr. Stogie Santa representing Mr. Jay Zavana Smoke Shop. We've got Mr. Skip Martin on the lines via Skype from Roma Craft Tobacco. Of course, who just jumped off the just, fucking he did, porch. No, he, 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 he took the elevator down. He jumped in the pool. He's going to change his camera angle. He's going to be the buff. Uh, of course, Mr. Jay Zavana Smoke Shop located right here in Rhode Island, right down the street from the studio. You can find a bunch of premium handmade cigars there. Oh, yeah. Fantastic selection. Of course, mm -hmm. uh, Stogie Sandy, you've, you've worked there for a, a long time. Yeah, uh, for a while. But uh, you know what? I walked in. You said you had free Wi-Fi one day and a yeah. sign, and uh, then it was just it was that was it. it was the, a geek, the, the first right. the geekiness got you. And I was like, I can hang in here yeah. and I can work, and then Stogie Sandy can tell me about fabulous cigars, and I can just give them my money, <laughs> and then I have fabulous cigars, and it was just a marriage made in heaven. Oh yeah. Um, and they've got this. Um, of course, the Jay Grotto series as well. Mm -hmm. which the is anniversary. Your, uh, yeah, the anniversary, which is a uh, mm. Paul Cigar. Yeah, finally back in stock after back a lot of... Oh, well, yeah. You know, that's a good... It's some ways it's a good problem to have, right? Like, we sold so many cigars, we have to order more, which, you know... It's the same with Skips. Yeah, and it's the same with Skips. And you guys yeah. are a, a bit... Uh, you're the exclusive Rhode Island Roma Craft uh, dealer? At is this point, yeah, yeah, but in the, in, with the BA coming. But we'll talk and, about And you guys you know. sell a ton of Roma Craft cigars yes. in your store. I mean, mm -hmm. ever since you first got them in, you told me, you are like, Paul, I can't keep <laughs> these things in stock. I, I and I go in there and I buy a few, and then, you know, you guys would sell even more, and you're like, these mm -hmm. things are just hot. But they've I've continued... I've seen it firsthand. Yeah, yeah, but you've continued to just sell them consistently because a lot of brands that uh not a lot of brands but some brands you bring in you know mm -hmm. they get hot for a little while and then i've seen them kind of fizzle out right but roma craft is one i've seen consistently it's, be a fantastic seller it, for I, you, I, which I, is great what i've come to uh revise my thing uh, or selling techniques so mm -hmm. to speak for the uninformed, or as Jose would say, the uneducated people, first, when they think of boutique cigars, right off the bat, the hand goes up, and you know, it's like they stop and they think there's something wrong. So, what I know, what I say now, small batch, yeah, yep. that's how I put it, you yeah. know, small no, batch cigars, and that's, that's just and, good and sales tactic. It's, I like it's it. just the way it ha has, it has to be, yeah, uh, yourself, a coop, or people, or geeks, they get it, they understand what's going on, but general, the, the Majority of general public uh, does not understand what's going down. But anyway, Roma Craft from day one, I, I just uh, enjoy the cigar with, with Mike and Skip. What they've done this, what a great collaboration between the both of them. And, and it's really for a small batch, is one of the leading ones in the store. Yeah, by that's, far. That's great. It, that's it great. really is. And, and you guys bring in a lot of different cigars. So that's, oh, yeah, that's saying it a does. lot. That's saying it, a lot. It really does. And um, Skip has been more than a. Uh, Fair with us. He's been it's a great partnership. Again, and Skip, and Skip you're, you're, are you in the line now? Yeah, I'm here. Hey, welcome back <laughs> to the Story Geeks. It's good to have I you, Skip. Just, I, I was just going to let you guys keep talking. I was, no, I was no worries. <laughs> yeah, no, thanks, thanks, for, thanks for joining us. Thank um, you, yes. Mm -hmm. Now, we're, we're here. One of the reasons we're here today is to talk about the uh, this intemperance cigar that is a, a, um, an exclusive for Mr. J. Savannah Smoke Shop. Mm hmm. Um, so I guess it, right now I want to turn over to Skip. I, Skip, I want you to talk about the cigar. This is the Intemperance Revenge, correct? Yeah, so uh, that's a cigar that we made actually for Owland, which was a home shop for Coop. And uh, they, they underwent a few uh, challenges. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> when it, we had, we'd actually started, uh, all of our exclusive store exclusive cigars are actually event only slash store exclusives. And uh, we, we, we started with just having them in one shop, but now we generally will have those cigars in two shops. So that cigar actually is available from uh, Mr. J's and also on the, on the East Coast and also from Cigars on 6th in uh, Colorado. All right. right. Excellent. Mm -hmm. So, Skip, tell us about the blend, the wrapper, binder, filler, and the, kind of the, some of the goals you had for the cigar. So the filler uh, is mostly Nicaraguan, is, is, is pretty is what we say. Um, it's from three different regions in Nicaragua, uh, the, the Viso, the Secos, uh, and one of the Lajeros. And then one of the Lajeros is actually a Criollo from uh, the Olor region in Dominican. And uh, the binder is Indonesian, uh, which for me in, in blending is, is kind of like uh, having a, an inert binder. It has good construction properties, but doesn't really change the mm -hmm. the uh, right. <clears throat> the blend too much. 
And then the wrapper is really the feature of that cigar. It's a Brazilian Atapadaca, which uh, when we made that cigar, there were only two other cigars that I knew of that used Atapadaca, both of them being made uh, at uh, the old Latin Cigar Factory, which then became Scandinavia. It was the Taranio 50-year anniversary and uh, the Brazilian from, uh, mm-hmm. from CAO. CAO yeah. mm-hmm. right. <clears throat> and the, the person that blended both of those cigars is my partner, Esteban Disla. Oh. So he has a lot of experience with this particular wrapper. Um, we, we actually wanted to create the intemperance line with tobaccos that were more readily available than the Cro-Magnon Aquitaine wrapper leaves. So we started with Ecuador, Connecticut, which uh, was right off the bat, uh, the, the right blend came straight from Esteban. He'd been working on it for years. He knew exactly what he wanted. We were, we were going to put an Ecuador Habano on the other one, uh, but the Ecuador Habano that we picked out was so thick and um, took so long to ferment that we actually ended up using that for the Aquatine. Um, and one night I was talking with John Drew about this kind of challenge we were having, you know, what, about available tobaccos. And he said, whatever you do, I'm going to give you one piece of advice. Whatever you do, do not use Brazilian Atapadaca. <laughs> I'm like, he's told me that, too. That. <laughs> so he says he, he had all this tobacco, that he worked it for years, that he sold it to Fidel Olivas, and, and that he just gave up on it, that it was just too difficult to work, that everyone that used it actually cooked it um, because to get the color, but actually you know, kind of took the flavor away, that it was a great tobacco, but it was very hard to work with. So, of course, being who I am, uh, immediately I went looking for Brazil out of Paraca and actually went and bought the uh, what turned out to be about six years worth of out of Paraca from Fidel Olivas that John had sold back to him. Um, and since then, <laughs> because John was correct, um, I, we've we've gone to at least three different countries buying as much of the right kind of out of Paraca as we can, because because we made this cigar with tobacco that was already six or seven years old, um, we had to replicate it. So um, just maybe three months ago, Esteban and I were in the Dominican buying uh, as much of it as we could find that we're going to be using, you know, five, six years from now. So um, it's a very, it's my favorite blend of all the cigars we have. I mean, I originally, uh, we created the Cro-Magnon specifically to match a flavor profile that I was looking for. But uh, the one that I smoke in the factory all day, every day, more than anything, is something from this line. You know, um, I pick up stuff, you know, after dinner or when I got a little buzz going uh, in, at night, I'll pick up something heavier. But um, this blend for me uh, is my favorite. Uh, there was a lot of demand for the 56 ring gauge, which we, we came out with uh, the breach of the piece. Because people wanted a larger ring gauge in this in this blend, um, and w- when we made that cigar, I liked it a lot, but it still didn't compare to me uh, to the 46 that I smoked all the time. And then um, Esteban, because he for what I guess he has like a Zen connection with box pressing, uh, he sits in the back of the factory and just he box presses every single cigar himself. But the blockheads in the Cro Magnon line and this in the Intemperance line. Um, I asked him, you know, we had some, we had some underfilled cigars that were Segundos and I said, Hey, why don't you box press this and see how it goes? And, uh, because the Tarano 50 year in the box press Robusto was my fa- one of my favorite Tarano's ever made. So when we box press this out of Paraca, it completely changed the flavor profile for me in, in that 56 ring gauge. And it made it a lot more pleasant to smoke. So, um, Right now, it's probably the most sought after of the intemperance, even though the 46 is still my favorite, the little uh, petite Corona. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I mean, this is one of those where when when we get an aesthetic issue on a cigar, we're very quick to say, oh, this is a Segundo. So we have a a batch of them, you know, Mm -hmm. (laughs) that we can that we can smoke. So. Yeah, it's interesting that the box press on this cigar, it seems flatter on on one side than the other. Was that is that on purpose or? Well, we use we use a, a soft press, so um, it's it's a, it's a kind of an inaccurate box press. Some some factories actually mold in a in that shape. Um, we actually make a an underfilled round fifty six cigar 
and then press it down. And then just because of time, the kind of pressure kind of releases a little bit and, and you know, one side or the other generally kind of rounds out a little bit. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. Yeah. And, and these have been selling really well. Oh, I, unbelievable. Can't keep them in stock. Now, this, now that I, I, <laughs> we, we've been, <laughs> we had trickled down, I mean, Skip has done everything and Mike, everything in the power to keep us uh, – restocked and and i just couldn't put it out on the social media yet because of the the, the demand i couldn't right. fill it now after tonight i can't it's rocking and rolling and everything's rock going okay, so we got everything People that can you call need. The store. Yeah, oh yeah they can get bundles they, they come in when you pull up that uh, bundle for the they come in bundles right? yeah bundle we got boxes also yeah no and you have boxes now too yes okay yep cool. so we're we, we we're on hand we're ready to rock and roll call the store and this we'll is, take care of it this isn't an overpowering smoke no not at all it's, not it's at more all. of a medium i would call it almost a medium body medium yeah medium, medium for me medium to medium full yeah but it's not it's not overpowering i mean no, you look at the wrapper and the box press and you might say, well, this has got some strength to it. Perfect but. balance of that little bit of pepper. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I just love that. I, I love of, that. I it's really that, do. For me, it's in that chocolate flavor wheel. I don't get the chocolate flavor no? off it, no. I get a little bit of it. Nah, it's slight. I don't know. For me, I, I, I don't know. I don't get I don't that. Know. I'm probably like <laughs> six or seven cigars deep, so. Okay, I mean. whatever. Yeah. But it, it's well, just. Well, a, you know. Go ahead, Skip. Yeah, yeah, no, I was going to say that, uh, you know, we only make 15,000 cigars a week uh, about right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, our. At our maximum capacity, the factory will only make about 25. Uh, so we, we've been slowly ramping up over time based on the supply of tobacco we have. I mean, we use about $40,000 worth of tobacco a month, um, and we have about a million two now in, in inventory. Some we have a lot more than others. Um, but, you know, this cigar is an X percentage of, of our total production in terms of sales. And so... It's just one of those things where we can only make so many, and then because we age cigars so long at the factory level, um, you know, when we when we even though we're making these steadily, they're not a they're not a small batch in the sense that they're not made in batches. They're made consistently. Every Friday we work on store exclusives and and special sizes. So every Friday, at least one pair is working on this cigar, but you know that's 400 cigars a week, mm -hmm. right? So. Um, you know, then you're 12 weeks away from, at least in this blend, 12 weeks away from being able to package it. So um, it's, that's, that's one of those things where um, why, why we created these store exclusives specifically for stores that are in kind of higher tax areas so that they have something that they can generate sales from, from phone calls or on their, on, you know, kind of mail order or whatever. Mm -hmm. But also people who support us, so that they have something that they can say, "Hey, you know, this this is a, a cigar we we have." People pick it up because it's special, uh, and then they venture off down into the core line and and find something else that they kind of smoke on a regular basis. Oh, oh um, I, it's good. Yeah. So, I guess the, to the point you were saying about the the strength, I don't think any of the cigars we and maybe Coop will disagree with me, but I know Charlie from Half World disagrees with me. None of the cigars we make are super high in nicotine, except for now the Neanderthal. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I think cigars are like beer. Um, when, when I talk about body and strength, I, I always relate it back to kind of a beer as some, something that people can understand is you can have most kind of American Pilsners are low in body and low in alcohol. If you sell a Guinness in some states, it has to be under 4%. So it's low in alcohol, but it has tons of body. It's like drinking a loaf of bread. Um, but you can have IPAs, you know, clear beers that are 15, 18% alcohol that are very high in alcohol, but low in body. It, 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 it's not as easy with a, with a solid, like a tobacco as it is with a liquid like beer, but in general, heavier tobaccos have more nicotine and have more uh, body. But what we really work towards is create having fillers that have a lot of body that don't necessarily have a lot of nicotine. So it has a lot to do with the size of filler leaves we select, the texture of, of the different primings. Um, so we really do go for having a lot of flavor without it being completely overwhelming in terms of nicotine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, Skip, I'm going to agree with you on that because, and, and I'll take Neanderthal out of the equation just because it hasn't come mm -hmm. out yet, but I haven't heard anyone say that Roma Craft cigar has just, you know, made my legs turn to rubber. It's, right, It's exactly. never been that. It's like, 
man, I'm getting a ton of flavor, and you know, I really feel it on the palate, more mm -hmm. or less. All right, and that's a great point, Coop, because that's why this is why it's done so well in our shop. It's just that that exactly that's why no one's been blown away with a strength level or nicotine level. It's all flavor, and, and I'll tell you one one we just can't keep in stock on this back order is the e, the EC. I'm telling you, it, it's, I think that flies under the wheel of a lot of people because they people think of Connecticut's. They think oh, too light, too creamy. Uh, I I disagree on that one. The brotherly kindness that just that's something else we can't keep in stock. Yeah, that's a perfect example. It has mm -hmm. very low uh, nicotine percentage. Yeah. Um, the primings um, that we select in the types of tobacco we use are not mm -hmm. high in nicotine, but it has a lot of body. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, I did that. And I got you know the mode five, as you know, it's you know yeah, my, my sweet five. is my yeah. sweet spot. Yep. Really enjoying this. You know, the box press of that version is phenomenal. And I when I, when the, the EC came in, it was like people kind of st stick. They saw the kinetic. I said, I tell you what, if you're gonna in a different manner, what you gonna what you enjoy out of, out of that mode five, on a different aspect, you're gonna enjoy it as much mm. as that. And I'm telling you what, we got six bundles in. Blew them out, and I ordered more. Blew them out, they're now back ordered. People yeah. just they, they they love it. That's one of probably the best selling Connecticut's in the in the store, hands down. Interesting, hands down. And you're all out yeah. right now. They're going, going. Huh. It is. Well, and you know, I I think uh, another thing is um, all of our cigars. You can tell they're part of the same family. Mm. You know, you can tell they're related, <laughs> not just the, not just aesthetically from the packaging, but also from um, the flavor profile. We definitely have a I mean, Papin has a very distinct flavor profile. Um, Liga has a very, you know, the Drew Estate Underground Liga. Mm -hmm. Those cigars have a very distinct flavor profile. Um, Padron has a very distinct. Fuente, when you open the box, you know it's a Fuente. Only a Fuente is a Fuente, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think, I mean, when a cigar comes from Nicosueño, I, I could, I could, I mean, I could say this without qualification mm -hmm. that. I feel like if somebody just gave me an unbanded cigar from my factory, I would recognize it yep. uh, immediately, just based on you know certain certain aspects of it that that I feel are unique to our factory. Yep, very good. But and then with the store exclusive, I think was a good a, a great point for you, Skip, by having two stores doing it like that. I think that's just going to benefit uh, the yourself and the consumer. I think it was a wise you know you can offset any issues that you may arise in the future i think it was a smart move i think so. i mean you know we try not to i mean you know there's all these unicorn cigars out there where i mean fortunately we don't do a whole lot to market mm -hmm. so there's this hashtag those who know know it's like it's like people who know about roma craft and, and to this day even today there was three or four posts of like man i never smoked one of these but amazing i can't believe i never smoked one of these mm -hmm. before so you know i think because we don't really go out of our way to try to create demand that's greater than what we can ma match. Um, there's, there is a certain group of people at certain kind of stores that, that recognize our product. And so those people, when, when, you know, something comes out, they will generally call Mr. J's for this or Monty's mm. for the blockhead or, mm. or, you know, whatever the, the, the uh, situation is Lone Star for the Atlatl. Mm -hmm. So if they're looking for something special in our line that's not available at their local store, they'll call. But it's not like, you know, when um, when the, the Halloween series from Tatawai comes out and, you know, 20,000 people are trying to get, you know, 50 boxes of cigars. Mm -hmm. um, so even though they sell pretty quickly, which is good for you, good for me, mm -hmm. it's not one of the situations where someone who wants them never can find it. Mm -hmm. You know, because they, they come out, you know, every two to, you know, every month or two, a regular basis. You know, you get on a list with the retailer when they come in, they call you. Um, so it's not a unicorn in the sense that it's it's meant to be something that's super hard to find. Right. It's just something that's that people who really go out of their way to look for for it can find it. And, and to go back to what you say, the DNA of the cigars all being the same, and I can attest to that because let me tell you something: when they come in, they love the revenge by all means, but they just it doesn't stop there. You know what I mean? It's a Mold Five. It's a Cro Magnum. It's an Accutane, and it's Intemperance. It's, you know, it's it's really good to see. It, it, you did a great job of, of blending cigars. I just think it's one of it's you're one of my favorites out there. There's no doubt about that. But it's not just what I think. It's, it's what the consumer has done, what they've done at the shop, and they they have helped us out 
and so I can help out Skip in return and, and Mike and what they've done. Because I was with Mike at uh, a couple of two or three months ago. I don't know how long ago it was. Where Nat Sherman's and he gave me one of the uh, the the, the um, blockheads, the, but was the um, uh, Aquitaine. Was the Aquitaine block. Yeah, oh, I remember we talked. Unbelievable. Yeah. And was sitting there, that and there was a guy right behind me, and all I. I, I thought at first, he, he's, he said, I never smelt anything like that in my life. Mm. That's the, he turned around, that's what he said to me. That's funny. Isn't it? He picked, and here you are, it's a smaller store. I mean, not small, but small enough where he picked that flavor right up. And, and I'm telling you, everywhere you go, everywhere I light one up, people want to know what it is. And I says, Romacraft, very, very simple. And like mm. I said, the one, I, I, again, Mode 5 is my go-to, but the EC, I, I just, you talk about the morning cigar for me. Mm. What a black cup of coffee. Skips coffee with that, with the EC. It's, it's, it's pretty dynamite for that, me. That's, that's big words out of Stogie Santa oh, talking about a Connecticut. You yeah, really I'm not a you big Connecticut guy. Yeah. I'm, I'm not yeah. knocking Connecticut tobacco. Please don't misunderstand yeah. me. Right. It's just a preference. It's, it's hard. a preference it's, for me. You know what right. I mean? When you smoke no, regularly, I, I, I find it's hard to find a Connecticut that really hits your sweet spot. Mm -hmm. And I smoke a ton of them. And it's... it's not a small, an elite group as a 60 ring. They're a very elite group of 60 mm -hmm. rings that really appeal to my palate. But it's, it's a pretty elite group of Connecticut's that really appeal to my palate mm -hmm. as well. Like I, I said, mean, I'm, the, I'm the same way. I think, I mean, Connecticut is very hard to bend, blend with, to be honest with you. It's, first of all, it's a tobacco. I don't know if everyone knows this, but it's a tobacco that goes straight from the curing barn to the, to the cigar. There's no fermentation in Ecuador, yeah. Connecticut, right. because it's too thin and <laughs> fragile. So Excuse the me. conditions, the conditions in the curing barn, um, <laughs> the conditions in the curing barn, uh, and how it comes out of the curing barn, has a lot of impact on how it tastes and how it performs. Um, I also think it's a it's a type of tobacco that. It has it a marry it has to marry with with the the blend. So, you know, having 12, 13 weeks uh, for for the, the tobaccos to sit in the aging room, mm -hmm. which is which is an abnormal number for most factories, um, makes a big difference. And so, um, and, you, and then you have to blend around it. I mean, there's negative aspects to Ecuador, Connecticut. One of them is the aroma. Uh, it's very accurate. It, it's uh, um, you guys were talking with Jose about uh, Cuba. Um, you know, one of the one of the things I can tell you about Cuban tobacco that that uh, I'm, I very strongly believe, and, and Colin Ganley uh, and I have had a lot of discussions about this, is no one, no tobacco in the world, in my opinion, competes with Cuban tobacco in terms of aromas. And I think one of the reasons that is is because most Cuban cigars are puros, and so you have this harmonizing in the aromas that doesn't happen in, in cigars that are made from multiple countries. And the Ecuador, Connecticut is one of those where you have to offset the negative uh, aroma aspects with some things that are happening in the filler. Hmm. That's interesting. Oh, absolutely. Uh, uh, Skip, you actually just were in Cuba, is that correct? Oh. Yeah, I went to, um, it, I actually went to Cuba in 1997 with a, a magazine publisher uh, named Jonathan Stevens from, from uh, Chicago. He had a, one of these in the boom, there's a lot of these little cigar magazines in uh, I had a chance to go with them in 1997, and uh, I've always wanted to go back. Uh, of course, in 1997, I was just a young cigar smoker who, who didn't know much uh, other than what I read in Cigar Aficionado and on uh, uh, alt.smokers.cigars, which, which uh, probably wasn't the best source. Um, and then when Colin, Colin, who's a good friend of mine here in Nicaragua, uh, who, who does a lot of cigar expedition kind of tours, of, 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 of Nicaragua and the Dominican, uh, when he had the opportunity to start bringing groups to, to Cuba, he had been working on it for about six months. I said, man, I, I'm on the first trip. No matter what, I'm on the first trip. I might sign up to be your assistant to be on every trip. <laughs> but, <laughs> so so uh, on that first trip, there were, there were six of us. There was a retailer from Missouri, uh, Jessica Hudson, there, and one of her customers. Uh, Senior Chief Van Hooser and a na another Navy person. Uh, then there was uh, a retailer from New Hampshire, uh, Dave Garofalo, who I, who I had no idea was going to be there. Um, and then there was a couple from California, uh, uh, the Queens. So um, it was a pretty small uh, group of people. And, uh, you know, what I can tell you is that Cuba in 1997 
in, in Havana, in Pinar del Rio, uh, 2015, are in some ways the exact same place, but in a lot of ways are completely different. So it was an amazing trip. Mm. Yeah, well, what was your experience smoking cigars out there, Skip? <coughs> well, <coughs> excuse me. When I went to the Dominican, sorry, I'm smoking a Neanderthal, so <laughs> it's, it's getting me a little bit. Um, Kicking you right in the teeth, huh? Yeah. <laughs> um, so when um, I, I guess what I will say is when I knew I was going to go to Cuba, when I used to work for uh, Dell, I would travel all over the world. I had stamps from 30-something countries. And, uh, and I worked extensively in Asia and, and Europe and um, Latin America and uh, North America. And when, uh, when I would travel in the past, I would always bring my own cigars, which always amazed people because, like, well, yeah, but you can get Cubans. You know, if you're in Bratislava, you could buy Cubans. If you're in, you know, Penang, you could buy Cubans. I'm like, A, they're overpriced. Uh, I'm not paying $25 for a cigar on a regular right. basis. And B, I get, I get tired of them. So this was, you know, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, up to maybe three years ago. So I hadn't smoked a Cuban cigar in a while. And when I knew I was going to go to Cuba, uh, Esteban and I, for some banking things, stopped in Panama on the way to the Dominican. And an old friend of mine owns a uh, shop. And one of the things Jose said is very true is trying to find uh, legitimate Cubans is actually much harder than you think. Um, so this is a very good friend of mine who I know gets cigars directly from La Casa. And, and since the La Casa in Panama has gone out of business, he's the primary guy who, who gets them. So I went in and bought 10 or 12 different cigars uh, that that I w was familiar with. You, you know, the, the Romeo Petit, uh, Short Churchill, the, the Petit Edmundo, um, the uh, mm. Siri, Siri D, the, the Bahiki. Mm -hmm. So I, I, we went through it and um, I was posting pictures on Instagram and of course every Cuban apologist in the, on Instagram immediately when I said something negative said, well, that's not a legitimate Cuban cigar. <laughs> so huh. I'm like, I'm like, well, A, I understand how to identify fake packaging. B, more than anything, I know the taste and smell of Cuban tobacco. Um, I actually, we actually use Cuban tobacco in our factory for a cigar we make for Germany, um, it's only two varieties, but um, I'm very familiar with Cuban tobacco. And so, um, you know, my feeling buying as a customer from a retail shop was not a good experience. And then when I went to the Dominican, we actually visited and did an event at a shop in, uh, in uh, Santiago, uh, Cameroon Cigar, where, who, who was a big retailer for us in the Dominican uh, of Romacraft. So, um, when I was in Santiago, I also visited La Casa del Habano in Santiago, um, talked to the, the general manager about my experience in Panama, showed him a couple of examples, um, smoked some, some tubos from that shop. I mean, what I've found is that as a consumer, whether you're buying from a duty-free or buying from a retailer, the best bet almost always is a tubo uh, for a lot of reasons. So I gave it the optimal shot and still had issues primarily related to humidity so when i actually got them back to nicaragua dried them out for two or three weeks the experience was much better mm -hmm. so going into cuba um i already had kind of a perception of you know the current situation with cuban cigars and then dave garofalo and i were almost on a mission to smoke one or two of every single brand that we could find while we were in cuba so between the two of us we probably smoked somewhere between 100 and 120 cigars um actually much easier in Cuba because they're about half the price. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, you know, and still there, you know, I think what Jose said is the truth is that um, the only cigars that I smoked out of those, you know, 180, you know, or 75 cigars that I smoked between Panama, the Dominican and Cuba that were very, that were notable to me with, you know, that were, were a positive experience were either a regional exclusive a Reserva, or something that's brand new that was made for the Habanos Festival. So, you know, the, the best cigar I smoked while I was in Cuba was Aroma Craft. <laughs> the, the, uh, the, the second best cigar I smoked while I was in Cuba was a cigar um, that, that was came out at the Habanos Festival. It, it's a uh, H. Upman 56, which was an excellent cigar. And um, 
you know, probably number three was a reserva that uh, Hiroche Rabanya gave me at the farm, uh, a Rabanya uh, regional exclusive, which was also excellent. So, um, but for the most part, you know, I think I don't want to repeat a lot of things that, that uh, Jose said, but I agree with, with 98% most of the time of what he says. And in this case, I think he's spot on. So, mm, cool. Now, you saw, you said from 1997 until now, you saw some things that stayed the same. What were some of the things you saw that was the biggest change that, if you can remember back then, you said were, that some were the same, but there was some that changed. What do you see the biggest change from that trip in 97 to now? Well, I think the biggest change is the food. Mm -hmm. um, I remember in 97, I'm allergic to seafood, so I can't eat seafood at all, which on an island is, is generally some of the best food you can buy. Mm -hmm. um, so I was pretty much in 97 limited to a, a small piece of chicken and rice and beans. Um, and most of the time, the restaurants that we ate at uh, were kind of off the grid, particulares that were, you know, kind of gray area legality um, that, you know, technically weren't supposed to be operating. Um, when, when we went this time, we every single dinner, lunch, breakfast we had was top notch even in Pinar del Rio. And so the quality of the food is, is um, amazing uh, in terms of, I mean, much better than an Esteli, much better than in, uh, or equal to, or as good as anything you could find in Managua. And, uh, you know, it, it's not on the par with the United States yet, I don't think, but um, a huge, a huge change. Hmm. Um, the, the second thing that I think changed the most, which is somewhat related, is, um, you know, when I went in 97, almost all kind of private entrepreneurial business activities were completely strictly illegal. I remember Noel Rojas telling me a story about the reason, one of the reasons why he had to leave was because he would, he would buy these wood sculptures and sell them to tourists and, and he would get caught so many, you know, he got caught a couple of times and, and uh, basically had to leave or get put in jail. So, um, you know, now there's a lot of trades that are completely uh, separated from the government you know, barbers and taxi drivers and a few other things. I mean, a hundred job classifications that are completely not connected to the government. Uh, they're regulated and taxed uh, nearly to death, uh, but they're, they're not, you know, feeding to the government, mostly service related jobs. Um, but even on the street, you know, one thing, you know, you notice immediately in, in Cuba is everyone, even if they're not a business person, has hustle. Everyone is, a, is an entrepreneur in, in one way or another because, you know, Jose said 14, 7 to $14 a month. But I saw actually postings that had the salary levels for rollers and bunchers and tobacco people. Um, I think it's closer to about $30 a month. Not that that's a huge difference. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, at $30 a month, you can imagine uh, you're not going to have a, a very luxurious lifestyle. So, um Almost, I would imagine almost everyone, unless you're some kind of pensioner or, or government employee, um, has some kind of side deal, whether it's renting a room out in their house, uh, selling cigars on the street, uh, hustling taxis for tourists, uh, arranging tours for tourists. Um, I mean, every, almost everyone you meet has some kind of hustle and where they're trying to make extra money on the side. And so uh, that was a huge change. Mm, interesting. Um, the third thing that I that I I think uh, that I saw was the the, the rum business. Um, I wasn't as much of a rum guy in '97, obviously, as I am now. But when the rum business in Cuba is a great example of when a foreign company combines with uh, one of these established uh, Cuban uh, businesses. And they invest capital, and they and they do things the right way, and they run it like a business. Um, they're very dynamic things that are happening. Um, some of the smartest, you know, most dynamic people we met were people that are that were somehow associated with or tied with the, the rum business. And uh, you know, I think everyone likes to talk about how the embargo, the end of the embargo, will affect cigars because that's the business we're in. But I, what I can tell you, uh, just from, you know, being someone who's a marketer or a, a businessman is the, the thing that's going to leave a long-term, uh, an immediate and long-term uh, economic mark 
on the United States market is rum. And, you know, whereas rum is not a drink that most people call, you will start getting after the embargo, people specifically calling uh, Havana Club or Havanista, which is the brand they're going to use in the States or Santiago. They're going to specifically be, be calling rum drinks. And you'll see the same kind of resurgence in rum drinking in the U.S. as you, you've seen with tequila and with vodkas. And Cuba will own that market. So hmm. and they're ready and they're ready for it. So that's that's another big change is uh, is how how they've uh, prepared I, I, and, and rejuvenated the rum business um, since '97. Interesting. So. Cool. Very good. Well, uh, Skip, thank you very much uh, for coming on uh, this segment and talking about uh, the intemperance uh, revenge. Very cool. Sharing your experiences in Cuba. I think now we're going to take a short break. We're going to come back and talk about our Stogies of the Week. Of course, Skip, you're more than welcome to uh, to stay on. Stogie of the sure. Week right here. That's it. Stogie <laughs> of the Week. Intemperance <laughs> Revenge. Exactly. Get those Mr. J's of on a smoke shop. What's the phone number where people can call? 401-822-0536 or Mr. J's Havana at AOL.com. Excellent. Thanks, everyone. We're going to take a short break. Come right back. Thanks so much, Skip. I don't know if my